My name is Rose Mystery Summers. I'm a member of Russell Reynolds Life Sciences Practice, and I'm joined by my colleague Dana Kruger, who leads our global healthcare sector at Russell Reynolds. And today we're delighted to be speaking with Stefan Bensel, CEO of Moderna, which, as many of you are aware, is at the forefront of the fight against COVID given its advances in vaccine development. Stefan, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. So just in terms of setting the scene a little, given Moderna's prominent role in helping resolve the COVID crisis, we'd love to hear a little bit about the journey for you and your team in recent months. Tell us a little bit about what it's been like. So it has been totally surreal, as you can appreciate. I think first, getting to a place where we got very worried about the virus, so, you know, like everybody else, you know, we heard, you know, late December, early January, that there was this new infectious agent. We didn't even know it was a bacteria or a virus at the beginning. Uh, and then we, we got to know it was a virus. We got to know it was a coronavirus. And so we, we went right away into working on the vaccine for it. You know, the, the sequence was published online in, on January 11 by the Chinese authorities, i.e. The, the genetic information of a virus. And on the 13th, we had finished designing a vaccine and we were making it to go into clinical study. And at the time, we thought it was going to be an outbreak, you know, like SARS was or like Zika, you know, or Ebola. We did not think it was going to be a pandemic. But because we had been talking with the NIH, with Dr. Fauci's team, and working with them for around two years on a few vaccines, including for another coronavirus, the MERS, you know, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, that happened you know, in the Middle East a few years ago. We had actually planned, which is kind of a crazy part of life, and we had actually planned in Q2 of 2020 this year to run a mock or fake pandemic, where they were going to send us a sequence of a virus we didn't know, and going to start the clock watch and see how quickly we could make a vaccine for them to run a clinical study in the US, just to kind of see if we could really you know, do something in 50, 60, 70 days, which we told them we thought we could, which we thought was science fiction. Just to give you a sense, for the SARS virus, it took Dr. Fauci's team 20 months to go from the sequence of a SARS virus to starting a clinical trial. And we were telling them last fall, we thought we could do it you know, in maybe two months. Uh, we ended up doing it in 63 days, which is two months. So at the beginning, we're just kind of running against this thing. And then there's a week that really changed how I thought about the whole situation was the week of Davos at the end of January, you know, a few weeks after JP Morgan conference. I had the chance to be very close to two epidemiologists, infectious disease experts that run two very large organizations that were in Davos. And I had the chance to talk to them several times per day. And sometimes they will share with me you know, on their phone data about data they were getting emails from coming from China. And what was very, very clear in that week is that the infection rate was very, very high. And the death rate was also very, very high. And those are the two numbers when you are in infectious disease, you always look at at the beginning. And of course, as you know, and you saw in the media, it was a big guess because you know, the data was not clean. And But that week was very clear to me. And then I had to convince my team because I got exposed to all that data in real time. And then I was in, in Switzerland and my team was back in Boston. And just this alignment of shared vision and shared facts was a first leadership challenge because my team spent... A few weeks, just kind of say, hey, you're crazy. And then it was really interesting how it was this typical thing you see in leadership team. You know, one person starts to believe it and another person. And then you see the whole team tilting and say, oh, shit, we've lost a few weeks. I mean, we need to go faster and so on. And because we're so in the middle of it, you know, sometimes people ask me, you know, did you analyze all the risk of doing it? And I'm like, no. And I'm like, how could we? Which is, there is this virus, people are dying, and our job is to make vaccines. So you don't, you know, do a big, you know, strategic analysis and go hire McKinsey to figure out, you know, what are all the risks and should you do it or not? I mean, people are dying. So you just chase that thing. And so we have been in this crazy world, which is we've been so focused and so absorbed by the work. I mean, the team has been working seven days a week for five months now. Sometime in the morning, we start a meeting at the first Zoom of the day. And somebody asked, you know, what day is it? And we have no <laughs> idea what day it is. And it's funny because, you know, sometimes I talk to my friends, you know, on a weekend evening or whatever. And you have some people that are basically stuck, they cannot do their work. And we are so busy <laughs> and so into this race. It creates a lot of issues. I'm sure we're going to talk about it. My biggest worry for the team is burnout. I know we still have another, you know, mm -hmm. six to nine months easy to go through getting this thing to kind of to the finish line. Yeah. And then think about my manufacturing team. They are doing a thousand fold increase of capacity in one year. Yeah. So whether you make car, you know, peanuts or whatever you make, Making a thousand times more in the 12 month time frame is kind of crazy. 
It's just fascinating to hear that story. And you were very clearly saying that the first leadership challenge that you felt was this alignment of vision, which you were obviously successful in doing. But from then on, you were in completely uncharted territories. I mean, you guys were setting the pace as well as you know forging the path. Tell us a little bit more about some of the changes you made in how you led, given the brand new environment you were now in. If you ask my team, I've spent much more time than before listening. And I think it's because of this totally uncharted territory that I wanted to try to not be in the weeds myself. Because initially I was in the weeds when I had to convince people to do things. And so what I had to do over time is to kind of elevate myself to have the ability to think and to really kind of be very careful about the inputs of everybody. Because as you said, we were doing things that we had never done before and that nobody had done at that speed before. And of course, because we're making a medicine, safety is number one priority. And so we took a lot of incredible business risk but we've always, always been very clear in terms of principles, which is vaccines are given to healthy people in the clinic when you're commercial. We cannot take risk on safety. The great news is, of course, Dr. Fauci's team knows the same principles. FDA knows the same principles. So that has allowed us to be very aligned in terms of where are we going to take risk and where are we not going to take risk. So if you look at the speed at which we're moving into the clinic, you know, the phase one is on top of a phase two is on top of a phase three. And so you could think without going to the details. I mean, what they're doing is not safe. And actually, the only thing that is always gating to go to the next phase is the safety data. So what we've done is we've gone to phase two without having the neutralizing antibody data, i.e. has the vaccine a chance of working. But we had all the safety data that we knew by going from 45 people to 600 people. We were not taking an undue risk in exposing more people to this investigational vaccine or vaccine candidate, because we knew the safety of a vaccine was what we expected, because so we have a platform, which is another piece that I think has helped us tremendously, including in some of our discussion with the agency, with the FDA, is that they have done a lot of work, and I need to give a lot of kudos to the FDA and to NIAD and you know the division of NIH you know, that Dr. Fauci is leading, where people have done a lot of work across all of our vaccines. You know, this is our 10th vaccine in the clinic. We put nine vaccines with the same technology before to realize that we have a platform so that what we have done in flu or in Zika vaccines can be used to understand the parameter of the safety at different doses of antibody concentration and so on, because we really have kind of an information-based platform because mRNA is an information molecule. And so I think there was a lot of pieces where the agency spent a lot of time going back through all our talks data for all the previous vaccine, all the human data, and looking at it as a whole to understand, okay, what do we know about this platform? What do we not know? And be very fact-driven. And that also has required us in terms of investing the time and guiding the agency through the data set and so on to kind of, again, establishing the trust so that we could work from the same ground of data. So I think sometimes what we have done is investing a lot of time just to get alignment. Like I had to do it with my team internally to do it with NIAD, with Operation Warp Speed now, that we're part of, and with the FDA. Because, again, if people are totally misaligned, you waste so much time. And sometimes it's very counterintuitive that investing time at the beginning is going to make you go much faster after. You know, especially in a crisis, you just want to get moving. You want to be in action. Yeah. And there's been so many cases, I remember, you know, one of the cases in B-School, where you're by teams and you're dealing with a, a crisis and so on. And actually, if you look at the, <laughs> at the outcome of the cases, the teams that move first all died <laughs> because they made a fundamental mistake that they didn't spend time thinking or getting aligned and so on. And so I think that's, that's another piece that I've tried to do is to not be in the weeds anymore, to allow me to be thinking, to be the safeguard of a team because they have to do so much so fast that if everybody's just running, 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 that's where I think you have a highest chance of making a big mistake. I know you mentioned before, you've got these concerns about your team at burning out, which I think is a really real one. You know, Moderna's got a very interesting, like tight-knit, highly engaged executive team. And so you probably spent a lot of time together already. But now as you're navigating this crisis, what are you learning about them? Has the dynamic changed? Or you know, what are you sort of observing about your leaders at this time? The team has been really remarkable because I think everybody is so mission-driven that there is no other product that we do that is more on mission than this one. You know, we have 23 products in development and all of them, if you look at it, you know, from cancer to rare genetic disease are all super important because people are hurting every day. 
That's why I think the team is so engaged and so passionate about making this new technology work so we can help a lot of people. But this one is very personal to all of us. And so the team has been incredibly engaged. I think the team has, and I put myself in the team, has really struggled in this kind of Zoom world because, you know, people are not two dimensional. And, and when you have a large group of people, even just to look at the body language of everybody is much harder when they are in a tiny bit on the screen. And I think the informal discussions, part I think of what the team has done to climb many mountains since we started the company is a camaraderie and a trust that everybody I think on this team feels super comfortable going at somebody else say, hey, I don't know this, I need help. I'm not sure about this one, what do you think? And this informality is super easy when you are, you know, two or three away from somebody or sometimes, you know, you walk and you go to get a coffee and you see somebody and you think, I say, oh, I'm going to go ask Tracy what she thinks. And in this world where you don't know if you're bothering somebody, they're on a Zoom with 25 other people and so on. The informality that I think is important when you go at very high speed or when there's a lot of ambiguity and a lot of uncertainty. There's an incredible uncertainty in what we're doing. Uh, what we're doing has never been done before by us at this speed. And I don't think by anybody else in the world at this speed. And so there's a lot of things that we have to invent. And I think this type of tool living in the Zoom world is good to kind of you know do checks and be very task driven. But I think the process of creating or inventing is very hard. Or sometimes you need a kind of whiteboard and you know I go write something or draw something and somebody takes my pen and just built on it. That creative process, and I don't know because I've not had the time to talk to people that are more in a creative process, like you no know, ad agency or people that where it's really what they do to see how they're living the Zoom experience. Because I think running things you can do very well in that setup. I just don't know how people in the creative world are doing right now in terms of this kind of isolation. The piece I've observed is, as you know, many of us are introverts, many of us are extroverts. I worry a bit about the, the introverts that don't necessarily reach out to people, where the, 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 the physical isolation might please them a lot to kind of their natural strength and tendencies, but it might not be good for kind of their, their productivity and the, their impact and their efficiency with their colleagues. Whereas, you know, if you are, all, you know, mingling and, you know, running into each other at the cafeteria or into the coffee room or sometimes, you know, you walk to somebody and you walk in front of somebody's office and you think and you just stop and you say hello and you spend five minutes. That is what I'm missing the most personally. The informality to check on people. I almost now I know I have to do a checklist. It's okay. Now call Marcello because I don't have a, the natural informal discussions. So put yourself, I guess, in the present, but in the future that looks a lot like our present. If we all really take a step back, I think most of us believe that our world has changed, at least for the medium term, in a very material way in terms of how we move around and interact and get stuff done. And it sounds like you're having a conversation with yourself uh, around, you know, how do I make sure that innovativeness is preserved? So you may not yet have the answer, but the question I want to ask you is, what, if any, key leadership skills are you thinking about really trying to develop in your organization for the future that we all believe that we're entering? And are those different than maybe even six months ago? What I like to always think about is how do you get the best out of people? And it goes back for me to some you know, basic things, which is motivation, energy. You know, there are things in my job that don't give me any energy. And I think that gives me a lot of energy. And the question in this world is, what's the balance between the give and take on energy level of people is, I don't know yet, you know, how it is for, again, an introvert, an extrovert, you know, a scientist, an MD, you know, for all the different kind of capabilities that we need to work together. The creative collaboration process worries me in this world. I don't think that we're getting bad at it. I just don't think that we are getting the best version of what we used to get. I'm an optimistic, so I still do believe we'll get a vaccine or several vaccines out end of this year or uh, next year. Dr. Fauci still says the same thing publicly, so and he sees much more data than I see because I only see the modern data of what's public. He sees everything. We got a bit lucky on this one, which seems crazy to say during the pandemic, given all the suffering that's happening. I think we got lucky on two pieces, which I like to remind my friend and my family when people kind of see the glass half empty right now, which is understandable given it's hard for everybody. This is not a very complex virus. Think about it. HIV was discovered in the early 80s. It's 40 years ago. There's still no vaccine against it. Think about how the world would be, morale-wise, if Dr. Fauci was standing in front of Congress or, you know, press briefing, saying, I'm sorry to tell you, it might take years, maybe five years or 10 years before we get a vaccine. 
Uh, and the other one is, so far it seems, and I'll be cautious because we're still learning a lot, that most children are spared from this virus. Think about the, the Spanish flu a hundred years ago. They were losing as many children as we were losing the elderly. Mm-hmm. Think right now, if the death toll will be twice what it is, and half of them will be children, and you'll be already knowing people as have lost children, and you might be worried about losing a child or a niece or a few or a friend of your kids in the next 12 months. That would be just horrific. I mean, it would be like, and that's a piece I kind of try to, to remind people. So I think we're going to get back to a normal world. Is it going to be changed? Of course. So I think, yeah, because I think through vaccination, you know, the day you have vaccines out and enough people are vaccinated, we want you to wear a mask when you go to a close place to be safe or to feel safe. I see that future that you're painting. I think we've also learned a lot in this period about how we do business, all the innovations that you've come up with in terms of speed to develop these new vaccines, et cetera. So what have we learned about our ways of working that might change our operating model or even our business models going forward? And what does that mean for leadership? I agree with you 100%. A lot of things are going to change, even though when we go back to a normal life from a a health and a safety standpoint. The piece that I'm not clear yet and... Tracy, our head of HR, and I you know, spend a lot of time talking about it. And because even the, the Zoom experience, it's easier when, you know, most people are working from home because everybody is, is access on a Zoom. What is the future going to be like? I'm going to go to my office and, you know, spend three hours a day on a Zoom with all the people that are not coming to the office and then spend the rest of the day, you know, in, in collaborative meetings. Do we decide there's two days a week, we all go to the office, but then does it make sense to have an office when five days a week, including weekends, the office is empty? It's going to be a real struggle for all of us as leaders to figure out how do you make this work in the new world? Because I agree with you. I mean, an easy example, you know, I talked about with my investor relation team because I've done, you know, all our investor interaction on Zoom. And so as I told the team, I mean, me going to LA for a day to see investors makes no sense. Most of them, I know them. They know me. We've talked together to show slides and again, to show content. Given the quality of uh, this type of tool, this is what we all experienced you know, five or 10 years ago, where the sound was bad, the image was bad, you couldn't see you know, facial expressions and so on. I have a huge you know, Mac desktop with the biggest screen. So I see people actually in real size. Yeah, so it's very it's cool because I really literally see people in HD quality. I told my team, I'm not getting back on a plane to go across the world to do an investor meeting. Uh, except if it's somebody really important that I've never seen, maybe for the first time or at the right time to go see them just to have met them once. But somebody I've known for years, why would I waste my time? Why would I spend the money? Why would I have a, a bad impact on the environment? Why do I get myself jet lag? It's going to get me less performing and more tired. You know? Not good for my health because I know my immune system gets weaker every time I get on jet lag. And my immune system is supposed to fight viruses and cancer. So I think there's a lot of things that are going to change. The piece that is not clear yet to me is how do we set rules and kind of principles on how do you not become only a Zoom culture where literally you say, okay, no more offices, everybody's in Zoom all 24-7, you can live anywhere you want and so on and so forth. But you still have the innovation, the creativity process that as we talked about a few minutes ago is really hard to do with this medium. But I don't know how to do it if I only have half a team in a room and the other half is on Zoom. So I think that some things like this we're going to have to figure out is what do we do on Zoom and we allow people to do on Zoom? What do we set as a norm that not those things have to be in the office? But then how do you make it financially viable? This industry makes you know, good margin, but think about the industries where there's no margin. I've talked to a few people, for example, in the asset management business, and they said that they are contemplating giving up all their offices. So, so I think we're going to learn a lot. And like every time, you know, humans try new things, they are going to be things that are going to be working and sticking and things that people are going to realize don't work and going to be adjusted. So I think it's going to be a lot of trial and error. And I think it's going to really depend a lot on who in the workforce is impacted. And I can see, you know, having potentially different norms between, you know, somebody who is more kind of, let's say, you know, in finance, in, let's say, P2P, you know, dealing with invoices all day and they can do that from home with the right technology at their home and so on from anywhere. And somebody who's part of a cross-functional team where you need an engineer and a scientist and a clinician and they need to kind of thread the needle and you might... So then do you go back to a place where, you know, renting rooms uh, in a more virtual is maybe how you... I, I don't know. We have to figure all those things out. 
But now we're focusing more on how do we get the vaccine to a finish line. But we're starting to have a lot of discussions around those themes because the world is going to change. Well, actually, that was going to be our final question in terms of, we suspect we know the answer in terms of what will Moderna be doing in the next few months? How will you be spending our time? But share with us, what do the next three to six months look like for you all? On the clinical front is, you know, how do we get the phase three started, you know, 30,000 people in July? How do we recruit people as fast as we can? How do we ensure diversity? You know, as Tyler, chief medical officer says, you know, if it's only, you know, people that are working from home to get the vaccine, it's going to be useless because most of them won't get infected. If nobody gets infected, we'll never have an efficacy without. And so what we need to really recruit in the study are people that are literally, you know, in the front lines, are people working in supermarkets, in Amazon warehouses and so on and so forth. This is more the type of people we need and from a lot of diversity in our background, ethnicity and so on, that's super important. So we understand well how the vaccine works and so on. So that's on the clinical side. And then, of course, getting around the BLA ready, potential approval of a product. And then the incredible challenge we have is on manufacturing, because as we said, you know, the team has to do a 1,000x capacity increase in 12 months. And so they are doing something that I've rarely heard of before across industries for you know, reading the business literature and, and newspapers and so on. So, so I think that they're really getting this thing to the finish line as safely as we can, as fast as we can, because we know the world is, is dying. And when sometimes we say, you know, six months from now, people are already is another six months like this. It's tough. I mean, there are a lot of people, you know, that are out of job. Uh, there are a lot of, you know, people that are supposed to be in college now that are missing kind of a super important formative part of our life. So we know every day it does count and we're still losing a lot of people. And, and like, I think, a lot of epidemiologists, we do worry about next fall and winter because we don't think this thing is going away. Thank you for your insights and thank you and the team for everything you're doing really on the frontiers for all of us. Great to spend some time with you, Stefan. Well, thank you so much for the kind words. Thank you for the invite. I'm super proud of the team. They are already doing an incredible job and we're going to continue to push again as hard as we can. We're still focusing on safety, but we know that every day does matter and people are hurting. So thank you for your time.